and uh, and we'll get started here. Um, okay, so today I'm going to cover um, tidy data, uh, the tidyverse, uh, like introduce the tidyverse, and um, working with um, kind of reshaping data to um, to kind of get it to work into uh, in R and stuff. And I recognize that um, there's kind of uh, maybe two teaching philosophies regarding STATS 20. And so, um, you know, depending on who your STATS 20 professor was, you might have already seen some stuff from the tidyverse or you might not, not have, okay? And so, um, so if you've already seen it, uh, you know, my apologies. I hope this will just kind of um, make things more clear um, or at least be a review that, that's refreshing. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, I think it's a, it's a useful topic for us to, um, to talk about. So, um, so let's go ahead and uh, we'll introduce the, uh, the tidyverse. And a lot of uh, today's um, lecture uh, comes directly from this book, um, R for Data Science, all right? And, um, and actually, I think this link actually no longer works. I got to fix this. So, um, you know, I'm going to later on, uh, I got to fix this link. Um, this one doesn't work. But it is free uh, to read. I think it's just free for everybody to read now. I think you can just type in R for data science and then they have kind of a, a browser-based book that you can read. So um, uh, so you can read that, but it's, a, it's an excellent book and it's, uh, this thing is structured entirely around the tidy verse, okay? Uh, written by Hadley Wickham. Hadley Wickham's kind of the, the author and creator of the tidy verse here. All right, and so the tidyverse is, uh, you know, they say that they are an opinionated collection of R packages. And that's because all of the packages um, expect your data to be formatted a certain way. And there's different philosophies and opinions regarding how your data should be formatted, um, but tidyverse kind of enforces this. And so that's why they say it's an opinionated piece. And I think you've worked, um, you may or may not have worked with different elements of the tidyverse, such as uh, ggplot2. And today, what we're going to take a look at is tibble and tidyr. Um, and then next week, we'll look at dplyr and gg. Well, we'll see how far we get. OK. Um, but I'll also, um, I've already covered readr. And then uh, and then we'll have a cursory look at some of these other um, tidyverse packages here. OK. But let's, um, let's go ahead and talk about uh, tibbles. Tibbles is the. Um, tidyverse version of a data frame, okay? It's basically the same thing as a data, data frame, um, but they tweak a few behaviors uh, that kind of make your life a little bit easier. And so, um, you know, R has been around for a while. Um, it was created in Bell Labs. Well, actually, S was created in Bell Labs, and it, S is the kind of predecessor of R. And so it's kind of, um, so things that were useful, you know, even, I guess 20 years ago or so um, aren't so useful anymore. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to kind of change properties of base R without breaking uh, too many things. So, you know, we, we innovate a lot of things via the packages. Okay. And so, um, so let's just talk a little bit about uh, tibbles, um, you know, and compare them to say data frames. And so, you know, one thing about a tibble is that when you print a tibble, it's only going to, by default, it's only going to show the first 10 rows, and it's only going to show the columns that fit on the screen, okay? Versus, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but if you've ever worked with a large data frame in R and you type the name of the data frame, it just kind of outputs, you know, like a thousand rows and it flushes out your entire, um, you know, screen and, you know, if it's multiple columns, you know, it becomes hard to read because you get all the rows of the columns up here and then they show up on the kind of the next line. And, and so, um, so the tibble is kind of screen aware and depending on how large your screen is, it's going to try to fit uh, only what it can fit. Okay. Um, so anyway, here is, um, I'm just creating a tibble here. So this is much the same way you would create a data frame. And I just give it some names of columns here. My columns are named A, B, C, D, and E. And they contain different things, such as uh, so this is a, a date time value. This is a date value. Here's just some uh, random, uh, not random. These are uh, integers in sequence. 
these are just random uniform values. And here are just some uh, randomly sampled letters here. Okay. And when you uh, print it out, it, um, it shows the, uh, the column names. Uh, one thing about a tibble is it also shows you kind of the, the type of data that it is. So here we've got date times, date, integers, doubles, characters. And it, uh, by default, it only prints the first 10 rows. Okay. When you uh, subset a tibble, one thing to note is that if you use a single square bracket on a tibble, it's always going to return a tibble. Kind of like the way when you use single square bracket on a list, it always returns a list. When you do the same thing with a tibble, it's always going to return a tibble. So this this might be something that takes a little bit of getting used to if you're used to um, R's simplification, okay? Um, so here, if I just say I want the first column, here I created a tibble. This is a tibble with two columns, a column X and a column Y. Column X goes one, two, three, column Y goes three, two, one. And here I just say, you know, I only want to select the first column. And so it returns the first column and it returns a tibble, okay? You can specify, you know, I want R to simplify this. I've only selected one column, so I want it to simplify it down into an atomic vector. And you can do that um, much, you know, similar to the way when you um, subset a matrix or something and you want to preserve the matrix structure or something or, or not, you can use drop equals true or false. And so here, if you say drop equals true, it's going to simplify it after subsetting and return an atomic vector. All right, so far so good. All right, and you know this is in contrast to a data frame, or here if I create a data frame. The, so notice this command for creating the tibble is exactly the same as the data frame, except I replace data dot frame with tibble. And here if I subset the data frame to just with single square brackets using um, using one column here, then it simplifies to a uh, simplifies to an atomic vector. Okay. Uh, if you want to, if you want it to simplify down to the atomic vector without having to say drop equals true, you can always use the double square bracket, or you can use the dollar sign notation. And this this will have the kind of the behavior that um, th this behavior is the same as with data frames. Making tibbles is easy. Uh, we've already seen this. Uh, you kind of make it the same way that you would make a data frame in that you list off the name of the columns and then the contents of each column. Okay. Or you can take an existing data frame and you just throw it into a tibble and it's going to make make the data, turn the data frame into a tibble. Okay. And basically a tibble and a data frame, you can think of them as almost interchangeable. It's just that the tibble has some of these behaviors that are slightly different from the data frame, okay? But anything that works on a data frame pretty much will work on a tibble. You can also um, create a tibble by row um, with kind of like manual data entry. Um, and this is, uh, the command here is the tribble, okay? T-R, uh, tibble with an R in here. And and basically, you give the uh, column names here with a led by a tilde, okay? And then after that, you put in the contents of each row, okay? So it's kind of like uh, sometimes when I, I produce matrices, you know, I'll specify a matrix and then I'll say like by row equals true. And that, that way you can, um, you know, the advantage of this is you can, uh, somebody viewing your code uh, can see the contents of the tibble uh, without having to print it out, okay? But of course, if you print it out, it will output it like this, okay? One thing to uh, one thing interesting to note is that when you print out, say, the tibble and things, I mean, this is similar behavior as with a data frame, but, you know, it doesn't put quote marks around ABC here, but it just says this is a character column here. Okay, um, if that's good so far, then uh, let me go ahead and give you your first view quiz answer for today. View quiz answer, first one is E. E as an elephant. E as an elephant for your first view quiz answer. Okay. 
All right, and so um, I would say the kind of the main focus of today's uh, lesson will be on this concept of pivoting data. All right, and um, and pivoting data is something that you might encounter when you get a, a data set from uh, another source. If you didn't create the data set yourself, uh, you might need to pivot the data in order to turn it into what we call tidy data. All right, and so kind of uh, you know one of the philosophies of the tidyverse is that um, your data needs to be tidy. And the three rules for data would be that every column is a variable. So each variable has its own column and every column is a variable. Uh, I guess it kind of goes both ways. Each row is an observation or every observation has its own row. And every cell is a single value, okay? You're not putting multiple values into, um, into a cell or something like that, okay? And every, every value has its own cell. Okay, and so here, here's a picture of data that is tidy data, okay? Each column is a variable. So we have the, col uh, the variables in this data set are storm, wind, pressure, and date. And then the observations are the different storms that have been observed. Uh, I think Hurricane Alberto, Hurricane Alex, Allison, Anna, Arlene, and Arthur, and things like that, okay? So we can see these are uh, one column for each variable. Okay, here is an example of data that is not tidy. Okay, and this is kind of common. If you see, if you go to some website, they might have data kind of presented in this form. And, and if you ask, well, what are the, what are the variables presented here? Okay, the variables presented are the country, and then the year is another variable. And then the values for how many cases, uh, I think this is cases of a disease, show up in, in gray here, okay? And so our variables are the country, which we got France, Germany, and the US. The years 2011, 2012, 2013 show up in the columns. And then the count of the cases kind of make up these different cells here. So one variable forms kind of the column headings and then the values are spread out across the columns. Okay. And here's, here's another uh, data set that, you know, at, at first glance, it appears tidy. And, and maybe this is fine. Maybe this is um, how you want it. Okay, you want um, New York, the particle size, either large or small, and how many, uh, how many show up there. Um, 23 or 14 small or large 22, things like that, okay? But it's also possible to present this another way, okay? And, and in that case, the variables that we, we might wanna present is the city, which appears in this column, but then um, we have the number of large particles and that shows up in kind of every other row here and the number of small particles, which also shows up in every other row, right? And so, um, you know, what if, what if we want to call them, you know, uh, the city, large particle pollution value and small particle pollution value, right? And so we kind of have these two different variables that are in, end up being stored in one column here. Okay, so, um, so this data came from, um, you know, there, there was kind of this, uh, presentation from our studio. And so I, I loaded up the data from these things and I just used um, readers read CSV to, to import the data and we're gonna kind of work with these here. All right, and so, um, you know, when you have tidy data, you can, uh, you can perform vectorized operations, right? So for example, you can do, um, we wanna create a new column called ratio and I can just take the co column pressure and the column wind speed and just kind of divide the two. And I can just do um, storms dollar sign pressure divided by storms dollar sign wind, okay? And it will do 1007 divided by 110 and do 9.15, 1009 divided by 45 and it will do 22.4, so on and so forth, okay? And, um, and so this, um, 
So that's one of the advantages of having tidy data is that if you need to create new columns, um, you can just kind of use the vectorized, vectorized operations. You don't have to run a loop that is going to do each of these calculations for each row. You can just say, take this entire column, perform this operation with this column, and it's going to it's going to run it for you. Okay, um, but you can't do something like that when you have data that's not quite tidy. Okay, and so here this is our cases table. Okay, and again, um, the the rows here we got a row for France, Germany, and the U.S. And then our there's a variable here, and this is the uh, the year 2011, 2012, and 2013. But these actually end up forming column headings here. Okay, and these are just made up numbers to you know cases of some disease. All right, so if we wanted to turn this into tidy data, okay, where we have one column for each, um, uh, one column for each variable, and one row for each observation, what would the dimensions of the resulting data be for this example? So if you think, go ahead and just think about it. What would what would the dimensions be for the for this. Okay, well, how many columns would we have? Okay, um, yeah, we have three columns, one column for a country, year, and count, okay? And then the number of rows we would have, we have a total of nine observations here, and so we the dimensions would be nine by three. Okay, and so this would our resulting data. We want we want it to look like this. Okay, um, so we're going to have the country France, Germany, U.S. in the year 2011, 2011, 2011, and then the number of cases will be 7,000, 5,800, 15,000, so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Kind of restructuring the data from this form into this form. Okay. So this operation, this operation is known as pivoting our data to be longer. So it's called pivot longer. And it's called pivot longer because the, um, the resulting data is longer, has more rows than the originating data, okay? Because what we're doing is that we're effectively taking these columns and combining them into one, right? We're taking these three columns, 2011, 2012, 2013, and combining them into one so the resulting data is going to uh, be longer. So we call this, this operation is called pivot longer. Okay. And so to, uh, to perform pivot longer, what we have to do, okay, is we're going to specify the columns that are going to get combined together. Okay. So we give it the names of the columns, the columns that we are combining into one column 2011, 2012, 2013, okay, uh, they're going to get combined or gathered into one column, right? So, so actually older versions of uh, uh, TidyR used to call this uh, function gather, but it's now called pivot longer, okay? And what we're doing is we're going to gather the columns titled 2011, 2012, and 2013. And you can actually use the colon notation. So, um, even if these were not numeric names, okay, the, the column titles could have been like January, February, March. You can just say January colon March and, um, um, and tidy R would, uh, would understand you want these columns, um, January, February, and March, okay? So, so you can just give it the names, use the colon operator, um, and it's going to kind of, it's going to pivot those or it's going to gather them into one column. And so the names, 2011, 2012, 2013, we want to put the names into a new column and the new column we're gonna call year. So 2011, 2012, 2013, those names go into this column called year. And then the values go to a new column called cases, okay? These are just arbitrary values that we pass on, okay? It doesn't have to, you can give it whatever name you want here, okay? But it's just saying, 
the names, when you gather them, they're going to go into something titled what? The names go where? And where do the values go? The values go to cases. And, and now we have the resulting data that we want. Okay, so this looks exactly, okay, so it's actually this, uh, I guess they have alphabetized by, or not alphabetized, but they rearranged by country. So we got France, France, France for 2011, 2012, 2013, Germany, and US 2011, 2012, 2013. Is that all right? Pivot longer. The, uh, the alum, um, oh, again, here are the kind of the elements. Data is the name of the data frame that we're gonna pivot. So we're pivoting the cases table. The columns are the names of the columns that, that are going to be pivoted, okay? And names two is just a string value. Um, and the values two will be the, is another string value, okay? So the former cell values get put into the, the values column and the former column names will be put into this years column, okay? The names are arbitrary. So if you didn't want to do values and cases, you can just give it anything you want, okay? So here we say when it happened and values will be uh, values two, that, that column name is gonna be how many, okay? Now these are not good column names, but this is just to demonstrate that there's no semantic meaning to uh, what goes here or what goes here, okay? So the names are in single quotes here because I have spaces in the names, okay? And so, uh, you know, when you use dollar sign notation, um, R generally expects your data frame names to be um, single words, okay? And that's why we generally recommend underscores and things like that if you need to indicate spaces. But if you want, um, if you don't want to, if you want to have a space, you can do that. And basically you specify them with a kind of back ticks, okay? And you can use back ticks to, to specify uh, you could even name a column a reserved word like for or if or true or something like that. This is not a good idea to do that, but you can do that as long as you put it in back ticks and then R will recognize like, okay, we're going to take the literal, literal instance of this and not the reserved word meaning. All right, so here's a question. Here's a question. What if I only pivot the columns 2012 and 2013? What's going to happen? What will be the resulting dimensions? And what are the columns going to be that I have? Well, let's start off with what are the resulting dimensions? If I pivot only 2012 and 2013. So I'm going to do pivot longer. Columns will be 20, 2012 and 2013. Only. All right. So, um, we have a guess it's going to be that it's going to be six by three right so this one ended up being nine by three so so we got one part right it's going to be a six we're going to have six rows but we're going to have four columns okay because um what's going to happen is these columns country and 2011 they're going to get duplicated okay for all the new, new rows that get created because um R doesn't have any knowledge of what these columns mean. And it doesn't know that like <laughs> country means something and 2011 means something it doesn't know. So, so any column that is not being pivoted, okay? So in this case, the 2011 column and the country column, any, any column that's not pivoted, those will get duplicated, okay? And then the ones that do get pivoted, those get combined, right? So we have six values to combine here in the 2012 column and the 2013 column. So indeed, uh, those six values get combined here, all right? And then, um, and then the names 2012 and 2013 show up in the year column. But then the other two columns, country and 2011, just get duplicated um, all the way across, okay? So our resulting table ends up being a six by four. Does that kind of make sense? What, what's happening here as far as um, pivoting and, uh, and only specifying a couple of the columns? Okay, um, here, what if when I pivot this, I include the country, country column, and I say, let's pivot the country column. So we're gonna pivot all four columns here. What, what would the resulting dimensions be here? So according to this, how many 
values do we have? How many columns will we end up having? Yeah, so we're gonna end up having 12 rows, but we're gonna have two columns. The columns are gonna be name and value. And so let, let me just show you what happens here. Uh, oh, okay, so first, <laughs> so when I first do it, I forgot. Um, it says, you can't do this because um, these are type doubles and this is a character. So I don't, um, I can't do it, okay? So, so R kind of stops you from hurting yourself and says, uh, I can't, um, I can't combine the characters and doubles. But you say, no, I insist, right? So, so here I'm going to um, just apply uh, as.character to all the values into the data frame. And then now I can combine them. Okay, now R is not gonna, um, tidy R is not going to um, tell me that I can't do it. Okay, and so here I've combined, um, I've specified I wanna combine the columns country through 2013. And the result is a, 12 by two table, okay? And so as uh, we have a column for name and a column for value and um, all of those values, France 7,600, 7,000 show up in the value column. And then in the name column, we've combined the different column headings, country 2011, 2012, 2013, and so on and so forth. So we've converted everything to character and yeah, and the entire column here is character and the entire column here is character because um, as far as data frames and tibbles go, the columns are atomic, okay? The, the data frame, you can have different data types, but within a single column, um, everything's the same, same data type. Uh, the columns are atomic. Okay, let me go ahead and give you your second quiz answer. Your second quiz answer is B, B as in bear, B is your second quiz answer. Okay. All right, um, let's go ahead and take a look at um, our last example. Last example or, or third example here is the pollution table, okay? And so here with the pollution table, we, we already have it like this, okay? six by three, and, and one could argue that it's already tidy, that we already have, um, you know, one, one column for city, one column for size, and one column for amount, okay? But what if you wanted to do something like, what's the ratio of small particles to large particles or something like that? Or what's the difference between small particles and large particles for each city? And, and that would be a little bit difficult to achieve when the data is in this uh, format here, okay? And so in, this, in that situation, we yeah. actually might want a column for small and another column for large, okay? And so, um, so to achieve this, um, okay, so this is what we have. Um, so to, to do that, for, to make our the data tidy in the way that I'm envisioning, because one could argue this is already tidy, but to make things tidy in the way I'm envisioning where we have the column for city, a column for large, and a column for small, what would the resulting dimensions be for that data? Yeah, it would be three by three, okay? We would have three columns, city, large particle, and small particle. Those are three columns. And then the th we would have three rows, one row for New York, one row for London, and one row for Beijing. Okay, and so this would be the, uh, the result that we would get in that example. Okay, so, um, so to achieve this, the command that we run is called pivot wider, okay? It's pivot wider. So we had pivot longer, where we take multiple columns and put them into one, and it, the resulting table is longer. And in this case, we're gonna pivot wider because we're taking values in one column and we are spreading them uh, across multiple columns, okay? And in this case, um, this one column turns into two columns, so it's wider, okay? Although, um, even though it says wider, we end up, we still, we start off with three columns and we end up with three columns. But, but in a lot of other cases, indeed, your data set will end up being uh, truly wider. So in this case, uh, we, get, we get exactly what we wanted, right? We had 
New York with large 23 and small 14. And now it's in one row where New York says 23 for large, 14 for small, London and Beijing. Okay, and so indeed this is a three by three, um, three by three tibble. And then we can perform vectorized uh, operations on these numbers if we need to, such as, you know, doing the ratio between large and small particles or the difference or things like that. All right, okay. And so in this case, the, the, um, the arguments are names from and values from, okay? So the names from is, we're gonna say, we're gonna take the names from the size column so that here are the names, the names for the new columns will come from the size column, large, small, large, small, those form the new names here. And then the values that go into this and that populate the cells come from the amount column, right? And so the, uh, the notation says values from, names from the size column, values from the amount column. And I think, uh, I think that makes sense. Okay, the uh, formerly this, um, older versions used to call this function spread. There is a cheat sheet for tidyr, and it still kind of uses the old names for the uh, for the functions. Okay, but uh, but it we got pivot longer and pivot wider. Okay, um, pivot wider is sensitive to spelling differences, and um, okay, so here. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess the question here is what's gonna happen if I perform this operation, right? So here I've changed the top, um, this first city or the first cell to NYC, okay? So we've got New York, N NYC for New York City, New York, London, London, and Beijing, okay? So if I do a pivot wider here and we're gonna take the names from the size column and the values from the amount column, what will be the uh, dimensions of the resulting tibble? What do you guys think? Four by three, yep, four by three is indeed correct. And so what happens, okay, London and Beijing, um, those turn the same way that we, we had before, but New York gets its own column and NYC gets its own column, okay? And here we have um, the 23, uh, this 23 ends up in the large column, this 14 ends up in the small column, and then we get missing values for the other things because there was no row that had NYC and a small, and there was no row that had New York and a large. Okay, so the result isn't gonna be uh, four by three. Okay, and R is case sensitive. So, you know, um, things that, uh, you know, have different, spellings or different cases or even like an additional space or something like that can throw things off. So you, you, um, you need to do some text processing to kind of uh, clean, clean up the stuff. Otherwise you're gonna end up with, with stuff like this, okay? Um, sometimes though, there, there is a situation where um, maybe you do truly have different city names, okay? So maybe this, this is actually a different city entirely, like maybe it's Buffalo or something, and, and you truly don't have uh, a value for like Buffalo and small particles, and you didn't have a value for New York with large particles or something like that, and you don't want NAs, but you wanna kind of plug in zeros or something. And so in that case, you can provide a fill value, and you say values underscore fill, and then instead of NAs, it will populate it with zeros for the missing values there, okay? And so you can do that in one operation rather than creating this and then doing, a, you know, replace all NAs with a zero or something, which, which could be done, but um, you can just do it um, kind of in line with this, uh, with the same command here, okay? And um, just, you know, for teaching purposes, I've been putting all of the arguments on its own line. Um, I think it's easier to read the um, your code this way, but it's uh, you know not necessary to have to put each argument of a function on its own line. But um, but at least for for teaching, I think it, it makes it easy to kind of see um, the different arguments that are being used. Okay, 
Um, so what, what's going to happen here if I, um, so here I go back and I start off with New York. So all the cities are spelled consistently. I've got New York, New York, London, London, Beijing, Beijing. But here, the number of large particles or the large particles is spelled with capital L-A-R-G. So if I um, pivot wider this data table, what's going to end up happening? Yeah, we'll end up getting um, a three by four tibble. Okay, we're going to have a column for all caps large, a column for small, a column for large, and we're going to get a missing for here and a, and a missing value for these other, other values here. Okay, and so, so this is fine. Uh, well, I mean, this is, this behavior should be expected. It's just, you know, it, it is sensitive to kind of textual differences. And so, you know, if you're uh, scraping the internet or something and you have data that looks all funny and things like this, you really have to do some, some time, spend some time cleaning up uh, the data to get it um, ready for, for this, right? Is it possible to use two lower and two upper um, within inline? Oh, I don't know. I mean, obviously you can, you can process uh, size and do two upper and you can do amount, I mean, and, uh, and do that, but can I do it in line? I'm, I don't know if I can, I don't think I can. I don't think you can specify size to upper like that. I think you have to kind of pre-process it and then, and then run the function. Yeah, so you can, you can kind of do it, at, do it earlier and then, you know, pass it on and, and do that. So, so that's possible, but okay. Um, so pivot longer and pivot wider. These are uh, inverse operations. Okay. So here is the pollution table. And, um, and what we saw was we, uh, we did a pivot wider. So I'm going to call this W. And if I do um, pivot wider and I say, you know, I want to actually back in this form, I can do pivot longer, right? And I just kind of um, combine these two columns, the large and the small columns back into one, okay? And so I'll just say pivot longer, and then I wanna do the names, uh, the names two, so the, the columns are gonna be large and small, and the names two will go into a size, will be called size, and then the values go to a column titled amount, right? So I can take W and I can run pivot longer, and then the columns that will get um, combined together will be the large and small columns. And, uh, and then we give it the names two and the values two, and the result ends up being back where we started. Okay, so pivot, pivot wider and pivot longer, these are kind of inverse operations, right? And so depending on your situation, sometimes your data looks like this and you wanna make, take values in one column and, uh, and stretch them out and you'll be pivoting wider. And in other cases, you'll have values across multiple columns and you want to kind of combine them into one and you're going to pivot them longer. So, um, so this is kind of um, a handy toolkit. And this is, this is probably the most common use for uh, the deplier um, function, right? And so these are just a couple more examples of pivoting longer and pivoting wider of the cases table. Um, so, so that's just, um, that's basically pivoting. And that's, I would say the primary use uh, I don't know, probably most common use for tidyr, right? So um, go to the documentation for the for tidyr and the tidyverse and uh, um, and the functions, it says functions fall into five main categories. And basically I just showed you stuff from the pivot vignette, okay? There's another um, thing called rectangling, okay? Uh, and <laughs> we're just making up words here, but, um, but sometimes, depending on the data you get, you might get um, data that doesn't look like a nice rectangle, okay? And it's going to be like n lists nested inside of lists, okay? So frequently, if you have um, data that's pulled from a JSON file or an XML file, um, you're going to have kind of these nest nested lists, okay? And so, um, so there's a family of functions called unnest. And then there's kind of the reverse functions um, 
of nesting. Okay, so there's also um, uh, functions that will perform nesting. I didn't bother covering them in um, in this lecture, but I do want to point this out, and and I just kind of want to show you a quick quick um, just uh, an example here. Okay, so for example, there's a, a data set called Game of Thrones characters, and it goes through and and it takes you know a character. Uh, Theon Greyjoy, and Theon Greyjoy uh, has appeared in multiple seasons and has appeared in um, you know multiple books and things like that. And so the data it, for each of these things ends up being like a small list here. Okay, so when you take the uh, the character's name, it's going to say um, under the column TV series. It's actually like a list of six. Um, six seasons because this it only I guess this data set <laughs> stopped keeping track after the sixth season or something or maybe it wasn't updated or something but anyway those are the only seasons that matter anyway so um, we have uh, we take the uh, this you know and it says okay so you know Theon shows up in um, through the first six seasons and so on and so forth whereas you know some other characters maybe appear only in two seasons, right? And, you know, spoiler alert, they probably died and something. So, um, so you, you have these different things and they're all kind of nested. And um, basically the rectangle functions, which are unnest longer and unnest wider and things like that will allow you to handle these data sets where you have uh, entire lists embedded within a single cell, okay? Which is not uncommon in certain web formats, right? But again, eh, I don't want to get into it. So, um, so I'll just kind of point that out and say this, this exists. Okay, we got spoilers in the uh, in the chat here, but um, <laughs> um, but anyway, we'll um, we'll wrap it up here. Okay, let me give you the uh, last quiz answer. I gave you two already, right? Okay, last quiz answer is A. A as an apple. A as an apple. Okay, and uh, and we'll end there. And um, have a good weekend, you guys. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, on Monday. Professor. Wait, just